Hello, and welcome back to the third and final part of the RSET training, Mapping and Monitoring Lakes and Reservoirs with Satellite Observations. We are honored to have two guest presenters from NASA's ISAT-2 team with us today, Dr. Michael Jasinski and Sabrina Delgado. Michael and Sabrina will be presenting on surface water heights and bathymetry for lakes, reservoirs, rivers, and coasts using ISAT-2 laser altimetry. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment which is accessed from the RSET training page. Answers must be submitted by Google Form by the due date of March 23rd. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by March 23rd. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. I now have the honor of introducing Dr. Michael Jasinski. Mike holds a science doctorate in hydrology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is a research hydrologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and is the hydrology lead for the ISAT-2 science team. He is also the principal investigator for the ISAT-2 inland water data product. We are delighted to have him join us today, and without further ado, I will pass it over to Mike. Hi everyone. Welcome to the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. The title of our talk today is Analysis of Surface Water Heights and Bathymetry for Lakes, Reservoirs, Rivers, and Coasts Using ISAT-2. I'm Mike Chesinski. I'm a hydrologist at the Goddard Space Flight Center and a member of the ISAT-2 science team. Before we get started, I would first like to thank Sean McCartney, Ameta Meta, and Sabrina Delgado Arias for helping put together this presentation. The outline of this presentation is first, an overview of the ISAT-2 mission and the science data products that come from the observations. Second, a more detailed look at the inland water data products, or also known as ATL-13. Third, analysis tools that ISAT-2 has provided for evaluating uh, the raw data as well as the data products. Uh, next, a more detailed look at uh, a particular inland water case, that of Eagle Lake in Northern California in October uh, 2018. Uh, finally, uh, a look at the applications of the products to 2D bathymetry, followed by a summary and acknowledgments. Now, here's a quick, uh, quick mission overview for those who are unfamiliar with ISAT-2. ISAT-2 was launched in mid-September 2018 and started producing data products a month later. The instrument aboard ISAT-2 is the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System, or ATLAS, which is a micropulse 532 nanometer LIDAR with a 10 kilohertz pulse rate and a single photon detection capability. The, the LIDAR is split into six beams, three pairs of strong and weak beams with an energy ratio of about four to one, and it contains a approximately 11 meter footprint. Now, when you add in the factor that there is a ground speed of about 7,000 meter per second, you can see on the figure at the right what this uh, results in. It results in about only a 70 centimeter translation between the pulses, which delivers therefore a nearly continuous altimetry of the surface you're looking at, whether it's land or water. A few words on the ISAT-2 data products. Up to now, most of the effort has been on the development of continuous along track products for six general areas of geophysical products, including land ice, sea ice, vegetation, atmospheres, oceans, and inland water. These are pretty much in a mature stage and one doesn't expect major changes to them in the future. Most of the action now seems to be in the development of the gridded products uh, in this tan area. In the particular case of 
inland water. Gridded products don't really make a lot of sense, and we are more focused on developing the means for each of the water crossings. Now, an interesting feature to point out is ISAT-2's unique observation strategy, one for the polar regions and one for the nonpolar regions. In the polar regions, there's an exact repeat after every 91 days. But in the nonpolar regions, after the first 91 days, the instrument off points for the second 91 days, resulting in a strategy as shown in this figure below for Lake Erie. After one month, there were 10 crossings. After three months, or the first 91 day cycles, there was about 30 crossings. And, at, and after the next three additional months, there was uh, 60 crossings, but all in different areas. On this slide, I would like to provide further clarification of what is meant by the ATL-13, a long track product. So if we start on the left, we have the principal highlighted geophysical products for inland water, which include the height of the water surface in both geodetic and orthometric units, the subsurface attenuation coefficient, a long track slope, the standard deviation of the water surface, significant wave height, water depth, and wind speed. And these sort of top level products for inland water are supported by a large number of secondary products, only a few of which are listed here in the table. Now in the middle, we have a schematic of the ATL-13 product where the six beams of ISAT are represented as dashed lines. This is intentional because the reporting unit of the ATL-13 product is a short segment represented by each dash. Now, the short segments are defined uh, not by a physical length, but by capturing 100 signal photons. And therefore, the uh, length of which these signal photons are obtained can range depending on atmospheric conditions or the state of the water surface, and therefore range from anywhere from 25 meters to a couple hundred meters, but generally average between about 50 and 75 meters. On the far right here, we've also spent time this year producing quality flags to help the user better understand these uh, geophysical products. These quality flags are unitless, generally ranging between zero and nine, and can be based on the processing of the data, on the uh, fit of the data to our model, or uh, taken from other ATLs, such as uh, the atmospheric ATL for wind speed or temperature, or other products that are available on the web, say from NOAA, including such products as snow and ice. Now slide seven shows a domain of ATL 13, which is defined by a global inland water mask. This inland water mask was developed by merging together various masks, including hydro lakes, the global river width from Landsat database, and the global self-consistent hierarchical high resolution geography database. This has resulted in approximately 1.4 million shapes or water bodies, each with a unique ID. They include lakes and rivers greater than about 0.1 kilometers squared, rivers, uh, greater than 100 meters, transitional waters, including estuaries, bays, and near coast. Now, every time ISAT-2 flies over any one of these shapes, shown here for North America, uh, the ATL-13 uh, produces the full suite of inland water data products, of course, assuming uh, favorable weather conditions. Now on this slide, we provide a summary table of the development of the ATL-13 operational product. And as you can see down below here, we are currently operating with version three, which was first published in March, 2020. And each time a new version is published, we go back and reprocess all the data products from launch to present. Now the exciting thing here about version three is that we have opened up the analysis to all the different water body types and shapes, which now number up to a potential of 1.5 million shapes. 
Also noteworthy here in column four is that with each new release, we provide not only an improvement uh, in the quality of the data product, but also in the types of parameters that are being published. For instance, in version one, we were focused conservatively just on the surface water height statistics. But in version two, we added significant wave height and coarse bathymetry. And in version three, we've added uh, wind, wind speed. I like to note uh, also that we soon expect uh, to release version four, either late this year or early next year, covering the same domain, uh, but really it focuses on an improvement of the uh, quality classification of the photons. And also here, a new product uh, that we're actually kind of excited about is ATL22, which will provide the transect mean quantities for the variables published in ATL13. So the question may be, how do I obtain the ATL13 data? Well, the answer is right here, uh, where I have downloaded the landing page uh, from the NSIDC site that hosts the ISAT data. And here for this particular case is uh, the ATL13 inland water surface height version three. Um, NSIDC does a wonderful job with uh, descriptions of the overview, how to download the data, citing the data, user's guides, several technical references, including the ATBD, and support if the information you, you're looking for really is not on there. You can email them and they will provide an answer to you. Uh, one just caveat here is that when you look at the data, make sure you have the latest version, in this case, version three, because there are still some versions one and two floating around out there and you might miss it. ISAT2 also provides uh, several more very useful analysis tools uh, that are available on the, on the, on the ISAT2 site, uh, not just open altimetry, but all of these here are listed on the left. And these are very useful depending on what degree of analysis you're interested in. I now I'd like to go through an example of one particular case of retrieving inland water data from ISAT2. And the particular case uh, I want to study is Eagle Lake in Northern California, here in North America, of course. Now, I think one of the useful, most useful tools that uh, the ISAT project has created for this purpose and for the purpose of browsing is from the Open Altimetry uh, website. And when you open the landing page here, uh, you are presented with a map of the world with approximately two days of reference track crossings. Now, one of the first things you should notice when first landing on this page are the two toolbars for both browsing and processing the data, one in the upper right hand corner and one along the left hand side. Pretty much everything you need to do or would like to do uh, can be found in these toolbars. Now, the database, of course, includes all the data products from ISAT2. So if we're looking for just the ATL13, we want to make sure that we click on the ATL13 button over here on the right-hand side. Now, when we get that far, uh, we then do our search over California in the vicinity of Eagle Lake. And you can see here that there is a reference track that goes up uh, the middle of of California uh, for October 19th, 2018. And you have to currently search day by day to get in the proximity of the lake uh, that you want. And so I've circled this here in yellow. And, it, and this lake right now just shows up as one little dot. Now I have zoomed in a little further over that particular location. And as you see, uh, now in this larger yellow circle, the data product for ATL 13 in that particular spot is becoming better and better defined. Now, 
As we zoom in even further, we can begin to see the definition of the lake and also the, th the three pairs of ISAT2 tracks over that lake for October 19th. And each one of these uh, spots here, these little circles, represent um, an elevation measurement. Now, another really handy feature at this point is that when you click on this particular reference tracks, it not only identifies this particular instance of October 19, 2018, when we flew over that area, but it also gives you, that is, open altimetry also gives you all the other all the other uh, times when that particular tract crossed over the lake. Now you can see that these tracks aren't particularly centered over uh, the reference track. And that's due to the off pointing of the satellite uh, due to the uh, vegetation monitoring scenario. Now as you zoom in even further, uh, things start to get very interesting, and you can already uh, start to make some preliminary conclusions on the uh, quality of this data product over this particular case. First of all, um, stepping back, you can see that uh, you have uh, three pairs of beams, and each of these pairs is separated about three kilometers. And uh, if you look closely enough, um, each pair, they're practically sitting on top of each other here because they're so far zoomed out, uh, you can see that there are many more strong beam short segments than there are weak beam short segments. For instance, on the far left beam, uh, there are approximately only one quarter as number of yellow circles as there are green circles. Um, secondly, um, I want to call your attention to this white box uh, just outside the circle here, which allows you to go to the next step to actually look at the elevation profiles of those crossings. So then at this point, open altimetry uh, takes you to a graphic that uh, shows the uh, elevation profiles. And you can click on elevation profile or ATL three photon heights. So in this case, I have clicked on the ATL-03 photon heights and also checked this box under overlay 3A that gives you the primary data product, that is the ATL-13 inland water height in WGS-84. So uh, what do we have on this page? Well, there's a lot of information. So I'm going to go, before I go into detail on this plot, I want to describe what's to the what is on this plot. First, um, on the right hand side, starting at the top, this plot will give you not only the particular date that we have chosen, which is 2018-10-19, uh, but it'll also give you the similar plots for all the other crossings uh, within that particular square. Secondly, um, you can choose uh, which beam you want to look at in this plot. It, unfortunately, it only plots one beam at a time. And then third, uh, it mentions the sampling profile. It shows the sampling profile for, uh, in, our, in this particular case, I chose the photon heights and the uh, data product. So in our case, the inland water height data product in WGS84 datum is this orange line that goes through the middle of the lake. So it looks pretty good. Um, so that's a zoomable quick look. Now also, the colors represent the signal confidences. So the highest confidence photons are the blue, when the medium confidences represent the green. And you can see here, as you go further into the water depth, you lose confidence in these photons. They're not as dense. So obviously there's some bathymetry or something occurring here on the right-hand side in the bottom, very well observed uh, at the onset here. But as you go deeper and deeper and as you proceed to the left, you lose confidence in those photons. In the middle, you can see a couple little islands as well. And then also here uh, at this point, you can uh, 
use this browser to uh, acquire some of the data so you can download and process them yourself if you wish. Now, now that we have finished browsing the product, uh, what I've done here is pull the data. Uh, I actually put it into an Excel spreadsheet and I downloaded uh, not only the ATO3 uh, photon heights, but also the, the inland water products that I was uh, interested in for this particular case. So you can see here on the right, uh, I have we have all the green dots which represent the photon heights. I have plotted on the surface here the height of the short segments, uh, which have centimeter levels of elevation dif differences as you go across this lake. I've also produced uh, uh, the output for uh, the ATL 13 bottom topography, which corrects the uh, elevation uh, for the speed of light in water that is due to the refraction of the light and also the product uh, I don't have it shown here but we have comp computed as we go across this lake the uh, attenuation of the 532 nanometer beam into the water surface now when we look at the analysis of the water surface heights uh, compared to root means of in situ date over two years we we find that we have a root mean squared error less than about six centimeters uh, when compared to about uh, 10 observations over two years. I would like to point out uh, that when looking over the data products, um, there are still some known issues out there that need to be rectified in, in further version. One particular, uh, one common uh, known issue for inland water is a striping effect in the data product. Um, sometimes one occurs uh, as a gap in the returns from the water surface. This is due to a dead time effect and kind of a, related to the saturation of the sensor. And a second there, after pulses that appear usually at about a depth of 2.1 meters and 4.6 meters respectively. Uh, these are not bottom. And uh, both the project office and our ATL 13 team is working on rectifying these problems. So I've only talked about open altimetry because that's what I know the best. However, if you are a real expert in processing large data sets, uh, please uh, take a look at the ISAT 2 tools and services provided by NSIDC. There's some really great stuff out there. And I've shown the link above here in the header, and there's a pretty good tutorial uh, listed at the bottom. A few words on data format. ATL 13 data, like all ATL ISAT data, are produced in HDF file format uh, at the granule delineation. Each granule consists of about five files per day, which includes several reference ground tracks. And in the particular case of ATL 13, the data exists only over water bodies. Each granule consists of metadata, ancillary data, orbit data, quality assessment, and uh, a six beam structure of the actual uh, geophysical data. Uh, the naming convention uh, for the granule is date and time, reference grand track, cycle, segment, release, and version. The six beam structure for the for each ground track follows in a long track hierarchy. Uh, important metadata include the ancillary data, the reference ground tracks start and end, and orbit information and spacecraft orientation. Down here on the left is a table of the segments. Uh, the globe is divided into segments or regions uh, according to ascending or descending uh, orbit uh, and latitude. So now if you dig into any one of the ground tracks, uh, in this particular case I've shown uh, GT2R, uh, you will find the actual data products along with the relevant information. 
So for instance, here we have identified, uh, as I said, GT2R, but with, uh, in the first file, ATL 13 reference ID, and I've highlighted the height orthometric and the height uh, of the water surface in WGS 84, and the standard deviation and subsurface attention each rate and water depth. So each of these files are now running in, will run in parallel. So any information, you look at a row uh, of, of, of the ATL 13 uh, reference ID, you will see uh, the equivalent rows of the geophysical data products. So digging a little further here, we can look, open up the, um, the datas uh, at the short segment rate. These are produced in 1D arrays, and we have uh, three values. We have the reference ID, the orthometric height, and the standard deviation of the water surface. So you can see here that from uh, in rows 83 through 92, uh, for that particular uh, water body, uh, we have in the same rows the orthometric height and the standard deviation of the water surface. In sum, the ATL 13 data product provides water surface elevation root mean squared errors of less than 5 to 10 centimeters under most conditions. And this is true not just for the Eagle Lake case, but for most, most water bodies we've looked at. It does very good in the vertical accuracy of the elevation. Other ATL 13 products are consistent with above. Now for bathymetry, uh, these products are retrieved mainly in clear waters and near shorelines. The best examples are in the coastal zones where one can often see 20 to 30 meters. We have good cases for reservoirs where we often see down to 10 to 15 meters. These are still near the shoreline. Uh, but for full two-dimensional bathymetry, this requires merging with multispectral imagery and it's really uh, a field that uh, many people are, are looking at and, and there's several very good publications already in the literature on this. So I, I refer uh, folks interested in this to just do a quick look at through the literature re review and you'll and you'll find some good cases and approaches on how to, how to do it that way. Uh, for ATL 13 continuous products, these are suitable for detailed hydrologic process related analysis. For ATL 22 mean products, which are a new product and will be coming out this year, uh, these are most likely more useful to applied science users especially in water resources applications and the calibration of satellite altimeters, including radar. Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I would like to also acknowledge uh, the many folks who have been involved in this project. Many of these are listed in the ATL 13 ATBD, but especially uh, the team who has worked uh, day in and day out here to develop this product. These are listed below and the support we've received as well from the ISAT-2 project office and the NASA Cryosphere program. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So you now have learned about ISAT-2, the inland water data product, as well as the various tools that are available through the National Snow and Ice Data Center DAC to access, visualize, and analyze ISAT-2. I have been asked by the RSET team for this part of the webinar to talk to you about ISAT-2 applications. ISAT-2 hosts an applications program which facilitates the feedback between the user community and the mission on the functionality and utility of ISAT-2 for practical applications. So in this talk, I will provide you with an overview of mission applications, of the applications uh, or some examples of applications for the inland water data product and also opportunities for you to get involved in our program. I am presenting on behalf of our applications team, which I will introduce momentarily. Mission Applications is one of the current key areas of the NASA Earth Science Division Applied Sciences program. It responds to the recommendations prioritized by both the 2007 and 2018 Decadal Surveys for Earth Science. This include the idea of societal needs helping guide scientific priorities more effectively, and also that emerging scientific knowledge be applied actively to obtain societal benefits. 
The applications program for ISA 2 was created in 2011, seven years before launch, and has as its goal to identify items that will increase or diminish the application's value of the mission, consider the use of the data products and measurements by end users other than the research science community during satellite mission planning and requirements development, and examine applications-oriented concerns and opportunities. The ISA2 Applications Program has been successful in engaging with users and raising the visibility of applications of the data. Collaboration with the Science Team, Project Science Office, and the National Snow and Ice Data Center Distributed Active Archive Center has led to a vibrant and active applications program. Molly Brown from the University of Maryland and myself guide and coordinate the application efforts for the mission. We get direct feedback and guidance for all of our initiatives from the project office, from the science team, and from headquarters. As part of our team, we have Woody Turner, Program Applications Lead at NASA Headquarters, Lori Magruder, who is the ISA2 Science Team Leader, Mike Jasinski, who acts as the Applications Liaison to the Science Team as a Science Team Member for Hydrology, and Tom Newman, who is our Project Scientist for ISA2. You have heard me say applications several times. What do we mean by applications? We define applications simply as innovative uses of mission data products in decision-making activities for societal benefit. Applications research provides fundamental knowledge of how mission data products can be scaled and integrated to inform research management, policy development, and decision-making. We are guided by three fundamental goals, enhancing applications research, increasing collaboration, and accelerating applications. In engaging the user community, we want to understand how ISA2 can be effectively used within analysis, forecasts, and models so as to improve decision processes needed to address practical societal needs. Also, the scientific information flow for different applications, starting from observation all the way to an end use and who's involved. Finally, we want to understand how ISA2 observations can be leveraged or complemented with other data sources so as to lead to improved data products. In examining the opportunities and challenges that exist in integrating ISA2 data for applications, we create a discussion around key data characteristics such as latency, mission lifetime, and resolution. We have learned, for example, that length of data stream is really important when exploring growth and change, and it increases the security associated with investment in tools, techniques, and decision support. Similarly, for some applications, such as CA's forecasting for navigation, ISA2's data product latency of 45 days for its surface-specific data sets prevents assimilation operationally in near real-time. The Applications Program has hosted at least one workshop, focus session, or tutorial per year since 2012 to create awareness of ISA2 and to foster dialogue on requirements and needs for ISA2 data. We invite you to join us at one of our upcoming events, which are all listed in the ISA2 Mission website. Development of the applications community for ISA2 began in 2012 with attendees of the first ISA2 applications workshop. The community now consists of 651 individuals who have expressed interest in the practical use of ISA2 data by either signing up to the community mailing list or through actual engagement with the mission via the various outreach events and the early adopter applied user programs. In 2013, we established an early adopter program to promote pre-launch applications research. The mission hosts 24 early adopters, which have played a key role in facilitating the dialogue needed to understand their specific user community needs and requirements. Post-launch, we now have an applied user program that allows you to partner with science team members for guidance in your exploration of ISAT2. We host quarterly calls with all of our applied users to highlight their research and to facilitate information exchange and feedback. Now for some examples of the ISA2 data by our applied users. Tcarta Marine, a global provider of marine maps, is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to estimate seafloor depth using data from NASA ISA2. In an interagency collaboration, the National Science Foundation awarded Tcarta a small business innovation research grant to commercialize new satellite-derived tools that use ISA2 data to map coastal water depth. 
With ISA 2, T-CARTA has mapped over 147, 925 kilometers square of coastal regions, gouging seafloor depths down to 100 feet with a plus or minus 1.2 feet accuracy. Using this new tool, T-CARTA derived over 10.8 million depth measurements in over 45 locations around the world during 2020. These new maps will help ensure the safety of ships, evaluate long and short term changes in coastal areas, and improve the lives of humans and marine species around the world. Rodrigo Paiva and his team at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil are one of the mission's early adopters who are investigating how to effectively assimilate ISA-2 elevations into a continental scale river hydrodynamic model for South America to improve bathymetry and roughness parameters, aiming at improving hydrology predictions such as river discharge, water surface elevation, and flood extent used, for example, by the National Water Agency of Brazil. Paiva and colleagues have developed the first high-resolution 30-meter water depth and topography maps for Middle Lower Amazon using ISA-2 for terrain elevation and vegetation cover to correct for vegetation bias. They have also investigated the use of ISA-2 to improve the accuracy of riverbed elevation estimation. Steven Tseng at the Center for Space and Remote Sensing Research of the Taiwan National Central University is exploring how to integrate water depth data from ISA-2 with optical imagery from Sentinel-2 to improve electronic navigation charts for navigation in South China Sea. Steven has determined that it is possible to model underwater terrain of South China Sea Islands with ISA-2. The water clarity in the region allows for penetration of photons down to 20 to 30 meters. Currently, Stephen has mapped six islands with promising results and will continue to work with the Ministry of Interior to produce 10 to 20 more maps to increase reliability. In 2022, Stephen will aim to operationalize the satellite derived bathymetry fusion method to map all islands in the South China Sea. So this concludes our brief overview of ISA2 mission applications. I hope that you will consider participating in the program and sharing your experience using ISA2 data. Uh, particularly, if you have any questions on the Applied Users Program, you can feel free to reach out to me directly by email in the email provided below. There's also more information on how to apply via the ISA2 mission website under applications. We also, as I mentioned, host a number of activities throughout the year, and we provide updates on those activities via the mailing list. So I welcome you to sign up to the mailing list as well. I'll be here to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike and Sabrina, for the wonderful informative presentations about ISET 2 data and applications. Um, this, is, this brings us to closer to the conclusion of this webinar series. And before we do that, here is a short demonstration of how to bulk download ISET 2 ATL 13 data. We already saw in Dr. Jasinski's presentation this YouTube link about exploring ISET2 data uh, through NASA NSIDC DAC. So this video has a lot of information and demonstration of how to use different tools from NSIDC and uh, look at open altimetry. Um, what here we want to do is just quickly show you how to use NSIDC um, bulk download data feature. And so here is the NSIDC site. Here we have a search window. You can go to ATL13 and search for the data. Here is the inland water surface height ATL13 version three data, which is the latest one that we want. When you scroll down, you will see that uh, there is overview of data, there is data download link, uh, citation of uh, this data, there is user guide describing file name convention, metadata, and a lot of information, as well as there is technical information how the data are derived 
uh, is given in here. Through support, uh, one can ask questions and get answers from NSIDC. The focus here is on quick demonstration of two things. One, how to bulk download data, and then how to quickly browse those data by using an open source NASA software, it's called Penoply, and the website um, web link for uh, NSIDC download um, is uh, available through our set website. So here, once you go to the data download link, you will be um, able to choose uh, region of interest as well as temporal selection is available here. Uh, just to be consistent, uh, we picked area Itaipu Reservoir, which we looked at in uh, last two sessions. We looked at Landsat data uh, and looked at surface water extent as well as we looked at radar altimetry for leak level height. And so just to be consistent, um, here is the box I've chosen using latitude longitude, but you can draw a box or a polygon in the area of your interest, or you can upload a shape file with polygon of your interest. Um, once you do the spatial and temporal selection, all the files available um, are uh, visible in this window here. Note that on top, you will have to log in to NASA Earth data. If you don't have an account on NASA Earth data, you can go here and you will be able to register with your email address and other information. Once you uh, log into data, uh, NASA Earth data, you can download data for free. Here are all the files, HDF5 format. These are the file sizes in megabytes, a start and end time for each of them. Once you have all the files, and if you have longer period, you will have many more files and you can still download them all at the same time by ordering uh, these files. Once you click on this and order your uh, files, you will get all the files zipped. Once that your order is ready, you will receive an email from NSIDC that your data files are ready. You can uh, then download the data on your computer. Notice also that to work with this HDF5 format, there are Python scripts available. And the YouTube uh, video just uh, mentioned has information about how to use the scripts also. And there are some tutorials in there about the scripts. You can download them. I have already ordered this data and I have received this email from NSIDC, uh, which has the order history. Once you go there, you can go to the order ID. This is the Itaipu one that I chose. And that gives me option to download all the zip files or individual HDF file. Once you download and save on your computer, you can quickly browse through this data by using Penoply. This is the open uh, software from NASA. It's very easy to install. Um, and can read uh, and that CDF file, HDF file, and also grip file can be opened using uh, Penoply. So here is the uh, inland water data. Uh, you can open file, navigate to where you saved on your computer, and here is this ATL13 file, that HDF file format file that I saved on my computer. This is just one example. Um, and here you can see ancillary data are there, all this geophysical data from three pairs of uh, beams. Metadata are available here, orbit information and quality assessment. Uh, let's just look at one example. Uh, this particular beam, a lot of information again is here, uh, but we are looking for water surface height and we can also look at water depth. But let's just focus on um, water surface height. Once you click on this, it tells you it's a trajectory feature type file and you can create a fall, uh, uh, plot. Uh, here, you will see that in we picked a region here uh, for that particular month of July, uh, all the uh, tracks available are uh, uh, shown here. And water surface height in meters, you can see the information here. 
So in the region of our interest, it is a few meters and you can find that out by clicking on this array here. You can see that this is time, longitude, latitude and value of height in meters. It's available here. So you can um, actually look at digital data uh, by going here. Also, you can um, uh, command on, on um, Mac, you can click on that and then your mouse that helps you zoom into this region. And you can uh, go th through all these and display uh, this data. So it quickly tells you if you pick different months, you can see how um, water surface height is changing. So this is just a quick way of browsing. You can bulk download and then you can um, just through Penoply browse how uh, water surface height is changing. So that is a uh, just quick bulk download and uh, visualization demonstration. Um, that concludes our uh, today's webinar. And so here is our summary for this webinar session. This was the last session. In the first session, we looked at um, all the satellites and sensors that are uh, relevant for looking at lakes and reservoirs. Um, and we looked at uh, Landsat and MODIS-based uh, surface water extent, how to access that data. Um, in last session, we focused on radar altimetry and currently available uh, JSON and Sentinel um, altimeters, how to access the data. We looked at G-Realm site from uh, Foreign Agriculture Service and how to access a lake level height data. We saw that as well. And today we had uh, information about ISAT2 um, altimetry data. So well, what surface height, how to access those. Uh, we saw that. Um, so uh, with that, we really thank you for um, attending this webinar series and we want to uh, thank our guest speakers for today, uh, Dr. Jasinski and Delgado for their wonderful presentations. Uh, here is the contact information uh, if you have any questions and our site website and training website page uh, are shown here. With that, we invite you to post your questions um, in the chat box and uh, we will answer them in the order that uh, they were received. So we will start with the question and answer session now. And again, thank you for attending this webinar series. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amita. Uh, and we are now starting the Q&A session. So for any of the participants listening, please uh, do post any questions that you may have in the chat. And we have a, a great panel of uh, ISAT2 experts that are here to answer any of your questions. So uh, jumping right into it, question one, I wonder if there is any related information about the lakes in the central part of Turkey which lies on the 36 to 42 degree northern parallels and 26 to 45 degree eastern meridians in the Middle East. Uh, Sabrina or Mike, one of, can one of you answer that? You might have to unmute yourself to, to answer. Okay, Sabrina and Mike, I cannot hear you, but I will go ahead and start answering. Okay, uh, okay yes, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> I think. Yes, we can hear you now. Great. Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Quickly, uh, I think Sabrina already typed in an answer there using open altimetry, but certainly Amita showed a great way of doing this was pan apply. So the answer is, is uh, that information is there. So just just use those two search tools, and you should be able to come, you know, directly to that answer. 
I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. And it looks like there's some some links there too. So hopefully, uh, uh, and and again, all of these question and answers will be posted to the training page, so anybody can come back and get access to these to these links to explore more. Um, so question two: Rivers with large surface areas, such as the Mississippi River, are significant landscape features. Unlike lakes and reservoirs, their surfaces have a shape. How are sloped water surfaces handled? And how often is a river's surface updated along its length? Okay, I typed in an answer for that. This is Mike again. Uh, currently, we only produce the ATL 13 along track products. And just like any other spot on earth, uh, we're just uh, producing those at the along track product and at the repeat frequency that's, that's, that's given. Now, true, the larger water bodies, be they lakes or very large rivers, uh, have a shape. And, uh, you know, one could, you know, conceivably look at doing some cross track analysis, but won't improve on the resolution, uh, uh, you know, of the model. We have what we have. But if you're, in, you know, have some ingenuity, uh, you can you can start to look at what's between the tracks. Uh, you know, for the, the the strong and the weak beams, they are only 90 meters apart nominally. Uh, that that can change different spots on the earth. But the the, the beam pairs are uh, three kilometers apart. So, uh, you know, you would have to have a moderately large, uh, even a large, you know, larger water body to uh, to look at the cross track slopes. Great, Mike, thank you so much. And question number three, uh, how can you find the dates for which data is available? Uh, if no dates are available, uh, as shown for Eagle Lake, does it mean that no data is available? Um, in open altimetry, the best way to do that is, is was as mentioned in our presentation, uh, is once you find the lake and the closest reference track, you, when you're in the browser, if you click on that reference track, it will give you the dates of all the ISAT2 crossings. Now, in many cases, there are no data. If it was cloudy, uh, you won't find the data. And that will become apparent very soon, you know, when you click on a number of those dates. Uh, like if you go into Alaska, there's, you know, certain times of the year, like in June and July, where, you know, just cloud covered, you know, can't get anything out of ISAT2 in those situations, you know, unless you peek through some of the clouds, there happens to be some broken uh, cloudy areas. Uh, so yeah, no data are available. If nothing shows up, uh, even though you have a date, when you look at the browser, if there's no data there, uh, you know, you just out of luck. Uh, let's see. You know, also, you know, what Amita showed today, you know, uh, takes it a step further, you know, and I think uh, in Panaply, you know, you can use that uh, as a browsing resource as well. Great, and it looks like Brock has, has dropped some uh, some links in the, in the chat for the audience as well. So hopefully uh, the, the link we provided in the Q&A doc as well as that was shared with the, uh, the audience. So please do and, and, and look at that document uh, to learn more information. So question four, are you aware of any Sentinel-3 processing steps to get inland lake height? Uh, do you have in your previous repository or do you intend to publish a webinar with that regard? Okay, I am not aware. Uh, so, but I'm sure there's folks out there who are looking uh, at this problem. So I, I just have to punt on this one. Uh, but perhaps some of the NSIDC tools can be used for a Sentinel-3. And in question five, uh, is uh, uh, can these can the data sets be used for dam monitoring? Absolutely. Um, so I, I answered this question here. I'm aware of of two groups do have who have done this, but I'm sure a lot more people have done this. A very hot topic. Uh, certainly, the folks out of Huilin Gao's 
uh, 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 research at Texas A&M. She's a grad student there. Uh, actually, he's graduated. He's a postdoc now, Yao Li, who's, pro, pro, who's already published a paper on, uh, is either T, TGRS or remote sensing environment. Uh, they looked at like 350 reservoirs using not only ISAT, but also uh, uh, radar. Uh, there's another nice paper by Jonathan Ryan out of Brown. It's in GRL. Uh, and uh, he's already published um, sort of a time series of, of the reservoir heights uh, during the period of ISAT 2, just so just over you know a year or so of, of data. Nice paper. So that's in GRL. And what we will do, Mike, before we post this to the website, which hopefully will be by next week, uh, we'll go through and we'll try to dig up some of those references and we'll put links to them so the audience can uh, access them in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, question, I don't. Yeah, I don't have the link. I'm, you know. This, oh, that's not a problem. Usually, uh, yeah. usually after the, the the time, we'll go back through and we'll we'll clean this up, edit whatever we need to, and we'll start adding some of these links. So we just wanted to, all those that are listening now that uh, please do come back and access this when it's when it's up on the website, and hopefully we'll we'll, we'll provide some of those links that that Mike was just referencing. Um, so question six: Is this data available for the Indian subcontinent? Absolutely. You know, one disadvantage as you move further in the lower latitudes, so you don't. Uh, get as much uh, repeat or or the number of crossings uh, sort of spreads out. This is a polar orbiter, so all the orbits converge in the high latitude. So if you're working in, you know, northern Canada or Siberia, or Alaska, you know, you, you get a lot of nice close repeats. But uh, as you move further south, the frequency will be much less. Okay, and question seven. Which start date of the uh, ISAT uh, can we download? And I believe they're referring to ISAT 2 there. Uh, ISAT is available from, from, from mid-October 2018, around the October 15th or so. So this answer has already been addressed by someone else, maybe Sabrina. And Mike, real quickly, can you, uh, because this is obviously the ISAT 2, there was a previous mission to ISAT. Can you just give the audience uh, uh, just kind of a reference of when that mission, when, when that mission life was? For ISAT, the original ISAT, uh, I think it went up around 2009 or so. Uh, you'd have to look this, I don't, I don't remember this offhand. And then it, it operated, uh, sporadically there was some trouble with the lasers after about a year so they'd only turn the instrument on i think it was three periods of the year or four periods of the year for about 30 days um and then i don't remember when it finally uh gave up its last breath uh but i think it was in the early i i can't say but it was it was it was in operation for maybe you know sort of five to six years stretched out Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Just to I, build I more context. It was 2000. Yeah, I think it was, you know, that can be looked up easily on the web. I, I think, I, I apologize. I don't know the answer in the detail. No, 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 no worries. No, no think, worries at all. And question. I think it was eight. more. Go ahead. Uh, how, how can we create a, uh, a time series of the surface of a lake? I think follow the outline that Amita uh, provided today in her presentation. Uh, download the the you know you have to download each data set. It looks like separately, and then and then process the data. Uh, great. Uh, and question nine: Does water turbidity affect the bathymetry accuracy estimated? by ISAT too. Absolutely. Turbid water um, prevents a penetration of the 532 LIDAR. So, you know, uh, your best retrievals are in, in very clear water, uh, like in the coastal zone or in reservoirs where there's, you know, sort of calm. Uh, 
not, not a lot of resuspension due to wind and things. Uh, it's poorest in the rivers because uh, rivers are moving generally and, and they're picking up and carrying sediment with them. So I, you know, in the coastal, you can go 20 to 40 meters. In in reservoirs, you know, we often see more than about 10 meters. In rivers, you have to hunt around a little bit and see what's what's there. And question 10, is a variable uh, bathymetry height reliable? When I checked before, it was not. Is there any way to use accurate bathymetry height? And they're referring to Atlas, uh, the ATL 13 product. Um, the current retrieval being used in <clears throat> ATL 13 is a statistical approach, and it can be affected by uh, other uh, well, it's affected by the you know the uh, amount of backscatter, uh, random backscatter in in the water. So uh, as as you go deeper, uh, you the large the percentage of your of your photons that you're processing are are just more and more, and it's harder to retrieve. So there's a lot of there's currently. Uh, you know, many areas where there's there's error. That's why when we publish the data product, we we put a we we indicate uh, a flag on it, and how reliable we think that measurement is. Great. And question eleven, maybe I missed it. How is the look geometry of the ISAT two? Is it uh, side looking or vertical to the target? Yeah, you can you can read the details in ATL three and uh, the ATBD. Um, it slightly points forward, and it slightly points. Uh, obviously, since there's uh, uh, three pairs of beams, one is pretty much nadir in the center, uh, but the two side beams, uh, you know, point off uh, whatever uh, you get for a radiance uh, a radian. Um, at three kilometers at an altitude of, of 500, uh, 500 kilometers. Now, that said, as we mentioned previously, there's an off pointing scenario in the low latitudes. So those uh, angles will even further be, uh, you know, enhanced by the off pointing, uh, depending on which cycle you're in. Now, I said, uh, records and, and produces uh, in the ancillary files the information on what what the angle is. So you should be able to retrieve that. So okay, we have, a, yeah, please, Mike. Yeah, so it slightly points forward, but it also slightly points uh, to the side. Uh, so it's it's not directly nader because if if you had that you'd get an incredibly specular return and it and it would would really oversaturate the sensor uh, you know especially in something like water or ice okay question 12 hello i have really enjoyed the webinar series thank you well uh to whoever wrote this we thank you for joining i'm really interested in understanding what other remote sensing data we can use on lakes I'm aware we can look at algal blooms. Is it possible to get gaseous data, example given methane or carbon dioxide? Are there any other data sets that might also be useful for studying lake dynamics? No, well, I'm not probably the best person to answer that question, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of work with, with radar starting way back with Topex Poseidon, the Jason series, one, two, three, and now with the Sentinel. Uh, data, uh, you know, those, you know, work great for altimetry for them, you know, probably when you're really looking at water quality, uh, you know, you have, to, you know, there's a lot of effort with the, uh, with the multispectral data, you know, starting with Landsat and MODIS, you got multiple beams, so you can look at, you know, how the, 
the light penetrates uh, with the different beams, and that will give you some idea of what's what's in the water. I think it's really a you know a, a science that people are are jumping into and trying to understand more. And certainly with all the uh, high resolution data uh, from Planet and Maxar, there's, there's tremendous opportunity for for you know trying to look into uh, you know what's into the water and at what depths. It's really an exciting area. I don't know about the methane though. Great, and yeah, as, as, as Brock just typed in that last sentence, uh, RSET has conducted quite a few webinar series on water quality. So please go to the website and you can actually filter the training based on with the application area. So uh, please, we do encourage you to go to the website and, and dig up some of those past trainings that we've done that might help answer some of your questions. So question 13, are there any resources you recommend with practice data and workflow recommendations slash steps that one could use to learn to process data? Um, no, I, I don't, I can't answer any more than what someone already typed in here. Great, I think that was Sabrina that, that typed that. Sabrina, do you, do you have any more information on that? Hey, can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the NSIDC has a uh, section on their website for knowledge. It's called Knowledge Base and has a number of documents and webinars that people can access. Uh, there is also um, the hackathons. Uh, Mike, maybe you know a little bit more about this, uh, but, but the NSIDC also uh, had uh, hackathons with ISAT2 data. They were focused on CIs. Uh, but but you can use that to also um, practice using ISAT2. And all of that, um, I can provide a link in, in the document. Great. And Sabrina, a follow-up question to that hackathon. Is that something that if some of our listeners, participants were interested, they could potentially get involved in the future? Yes, definitely. And um, what I would recommend is uh, signing up to the NSIDC mailing list. They have a mailing list that you can sign up to. Uh, that provides you information on the data products as well as the upcoming hackathons. Uh, there is uh, also a, a community, um, and um, I have to remember the name, but there's now an, a community um, that is available for people that want to share uh, their code. Um, and so that's also available. I'll pull up the name and, and put it in the, in the document for you guys. Great, wonderful. And uh, yeah, in question 14, how does one find out which coastal regions slash reservoirs have bathymetry data available to the ATL13 product and ISAT2 data products? Uh, so a follow-up question to that, can we get bulk download of data for all bathymetry products for ATL13 and ISAT2 for all times? And uh, another question, we would like to be able to import it in our database and run queries so we can merge this data with those from other sources, uh, NOAA, et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know a way to do that, but I think if you're clever, uh, you can, you can use the tools that are provided and, and, and get the information you need there. So. I'll add to that. Um, actually we have one of our early adopters from the mission and he developed a, a website called shallowbathymetryeverywhere.com. Um, so you might want to take a look. It's there's a couple of bathy locations that are listed there um, for people to get started. Shallow bathymetry everywhere. One word. Great. And and maybe what we can do is as we go in these questions, if somebody can maybe drop a link to that, um, so people can come back to it. I think uh, mm -hmm. they would they would certainly appreciate. Whoever asked that question would certainly appreciate that. Um, question fifteen. The new uh, uh, ALT22 product from ISAT will have a mean of the transects. Uh, can you give a couple examples of the products and applications from these products? Well, you know, obviously, uh, I mean, these would be more water resources applications. <clears throat> um, 
So, you know, many scientists don't don't many many fo many folks don't want the full transect across a water body, and and you know they don't need all that information. Uh, a lot of you know USGS models or other you know flow models we require just height measurements and mean height of the river. So those those types those types of applications would work. I think you can use your imagination and and uh, it's up to you to decide where how how this information can be applied. That is a great point, Mike. Hopefully we have a lot of um, researchers out there that are are listening and, and might want to see what they can do in their own uh, respective study areas. Uh, our okay, question 16, are these data going to be available in Google Earth Engine also? I don't know. Uh, I mean, somebody else wants to jump in and uh, help me out here. I don't know either, uh, but we can definitely contact the NSIDC and um, provide you with an answer. <laughs> yeah, it's always, a, we get this question actually a lot, uh, Mike and Sabrina, uh, you know, there's always the patience of, of hoping that Google, the Earth Engine will ingest the data sets that are, are uh, most sought after by, by specific users. And it's, uh, I mean, obviously it's out of our hands, but, um, you know, and actually one thing that you can do, whoever asked that question, you can contact Earth Engine. Uh, they do have a forum where the more people that, that request certain data sets, the more likely they are to ingest those other before others. So if this is something, because it is currently not in Earth Engine, this is something you'd be interested in, uh, certainly take part in that activity because your your vote, that email, that 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 reference will count towards their decision on, on what data set to ingest next. So just FYI. Uh, question 17. Hello, are there any other options in Panoply to do further data analysis, data analysis, or the, or is this done in Python? I think Amita should answer this question. If she's still available. Yeah, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, Python, right? Oh, they're just wondering if, if, if is there is can you do further analysis within Panoply or is it more of a visualization tool? And would you have to do the further analysis, say outside and say a different application? You can uh, do uh, further analysis. Uh, uh, you can compare data in Panoply, and we will. There are tutorials online. Uh, we will post the links here before we post this uh, document online, so you can uh, use that. You can make a time series also if you have uh, multiple data sets um, if for multiple time uh, days or months. So that's possible. And there are great tutorials out there. So we'll provide you links. Uh, of course, you know, using Python or any uh, language would be more flexible to for analysis, but yes, Panoply can be used. Okay, great, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mita. And question 18, after your experience with this satellite, how do you imagine an optimal satellite for the purposes described here? Well, how do you imagine an optimal satellite? I think uh, there are, uh, you know, as, as the technologies improve, um, ISAT two has been a pathfinder for for further uh, remote sensing, uh, lidar sensing of of the Earth's surface, and and there's uh, certainly uh, you know numerous uh, ideas and and Im improvements that will come in future missions. So I believe ISAT two is a pathfinder for 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 remote sensing of of the land surface, not only water, but you know, for vegetation, snow, ice, um, you know, and for the atmosphere. Obviously, for the atmosphere, you got all the calypso uh, and the calliope data that has shown its effectiveness for uh, atmospheric characteristics. Uh, calliope, C A L I O P.
Great, and question 19. Uh, can you give a sense of how effective ISAT-2 is in mountainous terrain such as Southeast Alaska? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of mountains in Southeast Alaska and a lot of glaciers there. Um, I think, um, It comes down to the reflectance of the of the surface you're looking at. In highly reflective areas, uh, you'll have uh, more a chance of defining the the topography of the surface. But in dark areas, uh, because of the variable variable topography, uh, it may be a little more difficult. But this this is like you know we mentioned before. It's up to you, the user, to be creative. Uh, the data are there, you know, photon elevation is a photon elevation, and you just have to use your ingenuity to, uh, you know, figure out how to aggregate and process the data. So it's, you know, it's a beautiful opportunity for uh, for people to to work with the data. And question 20, uh, I would like to ask about data processing. And how to use deep learning to get a high resolution and how to get data pre-processing for this operation. Well, the data are pre-processed at the level of ATL03. ATL03 provides the geo-referenced uh, photon heights. And it's ATL03. Um, so then it's up to you, I think, the user, uh, again, is in the similar question, to, to see how you can take these georeference photons and optimize the information you, you, re, you know you can get out of them. Yeah, it sounds like a research question and hopefully uh, whoever asked that can, um, yeah, uh, continue down that path. Question 21, I opened openaltimetry.org forward slash data forward slash ISAT and found many points on water slash sea uh, have positive elevation. Uh, and then they gave some examples uh, lat and long and they uh, clarified that uh, that's on the straight. So how, how do they actually read this information? Example. Minus five degrees longitude and well, um, I'm not exactly sure what what you're looking at here, but water C is a positive elevation. Well, um, make sure you're in the right uh, datum. Uh, in the case of uh, inland water. We produce, so ATL 15 produces the water surface heights in both orthometric units, that is EGM 2008, and geodetic units, which are WGS 84. WGS 84 will be the closest to, uh, you know, sea level elevation. The, 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 the W, uh, well, the EGM 2008 uh, are really used uh, over land because that that's the most representative datum that hydrologists use. It's a more practical datum. So those those two elevations will not be the same. Um, Okay, and moving on, question 22. I believe this is question for Amita. How do I download and install JavaScript and using Panoply software on my computer? I'm just going to um, post a link so you can uh, download. Uh... Okay, so. Um... 
how do I download the and install JavaScript in using Panoply software on my computer? Hold on, I should. Actually, in our very first um, session, in the prerequisites uh, and also on the website, we had recommended, and that's where Panoply link is there where you can download. But I will try post it here. Okay, so we'll we'll go to the next question, and then we'll make sure that link is is uh, dropped in there, so so they can go back and, and read some more on that. So question twenty three: Is it possible to process this information in uh, PCI, ERDAS, or QGIS? I don't know. Okay, we will look into that. We will we will. Uh, Post an answer, so please come back and, and, and use this resource in a week from now. So question 24, which data level is for direct user processing? I found many levels of ISAT2 products. Okay, so someone already answered this, but this is an excellent question. Um, the, the, the ATL03 data, as someone already answered here, is the basic level of geo-referenced photon elevations. That's the starting point for all the uh, additional uh, geophysical products. Now, I said too, uh, processed those geophysical pro products in 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 various long track lengths and is correctly written up here maybe sabrina wrote this is that the you know the whole pro the the pro uh the products from atl06 to atl13 and above are the aggregated versions and the processed versions of the atl03 Wonderful. And question 25, uh, it looks like Sabrina's answering it now. Uh, is there any documentation on how many water bodies are covered through ISAT2 data? Uh, Sabrina, can you answer this one? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so er, er, all the documentation is available for all of the data products via the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center. You have the user guide uh, as well as the technical references um so uh, so yeah so all of the information is there and uh the user guide will will provide you with um the table that mike uh, showed you earlier which shows uh what the, the number of uh lakes that are covered i don't know is there yep. i can i can ahead, ask yeah. sabrina i can i can add to what you said here uh, the 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 greatest number of water bodies are come from the hydro the hydro lakes database, uh, and there's approximately 1.4 million uh, lakes uh, greater than 0 0.1 kilometers squared. Uh, the additional uh, water body shapes due to rivers, uh, estuaries, and bays uh, are on the order of maybe a couple hundred thousand. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for that clarification. Thank you, Sabrina and Mike. And question 26, could you provide some more information on tools available to process the raw data Example given some machine learning tools to cleverly extract information. I cannot. Okay, we can move on then. Uh, question 27, if I wanted to get code for data pre-processing for ISAT2, where could I get it? So I'll just jump in here. I think, you know, it goes back to the other question uh, that you just asked. Um, you can, there is that IceFix community uh, what, that has, um, that is 
people, you know, data users and developers uh, that are working together to develop a, a shared library of resources, including code and tutorials and examples. So that would be a good place to start. Uh, but also, of course, then there is the NSIDC, and then they have the, uh, the tools page that you can access um, to look at, at the different uh, tools that are available to be able to process the data. For code, I would suggest the, uh, the IceFix community is to start. Great, thanks. Thank you, Sabrina. And I will say, Mike and Sabrina, you guys are all stars. You've done what very few have ever done is actually get through all of the questions and answers. That is that does not happen often. So big thanks to both of you for this. Um, I actually have a question since we've gotten through all the questions from our participants. Uh, I, I I understand that the uh, the Atlas instrument was actually Goddard Space Flight Center. It was being designed and built and calibrated, and this is where both of you work. So I'd love to hear how cool that must have been to be working on a mission where you could actually go and, and see this instrument being built uh, in, in real time. Well, the instrument was, well, while the mission was conceived and, and developed and specced, I think, at, at Goddard, the actual instrument, uh, I think it was built by Orbital, uh, and I believe they're in Arizona. Uh, we so I may be wrong on this. Um, so we didn't actually see it being built. Although before uh, before launch, it was shipped to Goddard, um, and we had an opportunity to see it there. And I, they were doing some testing there, so they brought it to Goddard. Oh, very cool. That must have been exciting, knowing that uh, you're going to be working I mean, with the data coming from this instrument. We we get excited, you know. I mean, we just you know saw this nice launch out of JPL of the Pers Perseverance uh, Mars rover, and to me, that I had just as much joy uh, watching the success of that mission as as we had. Uh, six, uh, with the success of the ISAT too so far. Yeah, and hopefully everybody who's listening was able to see uh, the, the 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 Perseverance rover uh, both launched uh, as well as land uh, last week. Yeah. And and if you haven't, definitely go to nasa.gov. Uh, there are some amazing video and images uh, that are coming out of that mission that just landed. Really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, Mike, thank you for. Bringing that up, and thank you for. I think this is this is actually going to conclude the the last part of this this webinar series. Uh, we would like to uh, deep deep appreciation to both Dr. Jasinski and Sabrina Delgado Arias for joining us today, both from the ISAT two team. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, I know that a lot of the questions, obviously, we could never have fielded without you. Uh, your insight and your contribution to this webinar, we just are are, are immensely grateful. So thank you for that. I would also like to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Amita Mehta, for, for leading this training, as well as to the whole team, the RSET team behind the scenes that you don't see, but that are working tirelessly to make this a success. That's Brock Blevins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn Hudson-Odoi. Thank you all for all your contribution and for everybody that's joined us. We do hope that uh, you will join us and, and come back next week to the website so you can access this question and answer doc. And don't forget the homework is now live on the website. So if you want the certificate, please do go to the website and you are now able to access that and start working on the homework. So thank you everybody again, and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank and, you for all the attendees. Thank you. And just a re quick reminder that you will receive a survey um, from our set team. So we request that you fill that out and provide your feedback about the webinar series. Thank you. I, I would like to say that we are just we are just, you know, uh, a small, a small, a small contingent of of this mission. You know, the you know the appreciation goes to the thousands of people who who put this mission together into all the all the data processors and all the upper level data products. You know, and 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 the team working together. So you know, we're just doing our small part here, and um, and it's exciting to to be a part of this team and
including all the applications folks who are, are making this available to the public. I mean, ultimately, you know, we want this data in the hands of the people and, you know, we get, we get motivated, we get ideas and we get motivation from the public who, who use these data. So thank you. You get the bigger th part of the thanks in my eyes. Thank you, Michael, Sabrina. It was great to have you here and share uh, your presentations and knowledge. I said that to everyone.